Lord, we pray now that you just begin to teach us, touch us, comfort the afflicted, Lord, and afflict the comfortable. Tonight, Lord, we just want to hear from you, and so for that, Lord, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase in me, and that the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh, Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Thank you, Jesus, for this lesson you have for us tonight, so important, so critical. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just pierce our hearts and minds, give us understanding to these things, Lord. Help us be released tonight from fears, from bondage from impotence. Lord, help us tonight just to know what it means to walk in your word, will, and way. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. What is the very first word that chapter 20 begins with? When. Would you underline that? Note that. Circle that. Do whatever you need to do because what is the next two phrases or sent, uh, words right after it? When you, when you go. And when you go where? Into battle, into war. Notice it does not say if. Jot that down somewhere because you've got a lot of space right there because it's a chapter beginning. Say, no, it does not say if. It does not say if you go to battle. It says what? Yes. When you go to battle. I love God. I love the fact that the God of the Bible, the God of the universe, the God who made us is a very practical God. Amen to that? Amen. He is not saying, you know, sit down, contemplate, empty your mind and visualize swirl peas and you'll have, you know, nothing there. He says in John 16, 33, you know it. What does it say? In this world, you will have tribulations. In this world, you will have battles. You are going to have battles of various kinds in this world. You have battles with yourself, don't you? Have you ever had that time when you had to put on three or four different things before you could even leave the house? You know, it's just like, ah, ah, you know, fashion nightmare. Ah, you know, it's just, it, it's not working. Battles within your family, battles within your Christian family, battles within your school communities, battles where we are all over. In other words, we have battles from the inside and battles from the outside. Some of you in this room have gone through seasons where you did not even know why you were feeling depressed because everything in your life is going okay. Why do I feel this way? I, I'm healthy, I have this and that. I know that God is on the throne and there's battles waging war within your own soul. The Bible says, when you go through battles... Man, I tell you, this book is so impractical, especially that Old Testament. <laughs> Man, straight up. When you go into battle. Now, the next thing that I want you to note is not only does he say, when we go into battle, we need to have an attitude of recognizing something. What does it say in James chapter 1, verse 2? You Most of you know it. Consider it pure joy when you go through these various changes, these various battles. Why? For the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You see, you might say, well, God, why then do you allow us to go through these things? If you're this good and awesome and loving God, where was God? Dot, dot, dot. Ever heard it? Ever said it? Come on, help me out. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's the thing. The Bible tells us that trials, tribulations, are things that God uses to test us. Now, test is a wrong word, or a word that often throws a wrong connotation, I should say. And more should be in the area of refining us. Because when we hear test, we think God is trying to see how we do. God knows how we're going to do. Amen? The test is for who? It's for us. And so He is refining us. Because as I said, some of you actually did go through vacation Bible school and go, Wow, I actually like kids. Wow, I didn't die. Some of you got on mission trips and you come back and you go, hey, I can do that at home. I don't need a passport. Bing, that's the way I take you. you. Begin to start clicking in and going, wow, okay. The trials, the difficulties. You see, someone once said years ago, they said Christians are a lot like tea bags. You only know how strong they are when they get put into hot water. And tonight, right now, you might be being tested and tried. Your patience. Maybe you've been falsely accused. Whatever it may be, where is your heart in this trial? Because this is what God says, that's what I'm watching. What I'm watching is, are you considering it pure joy when you are going through this various trial, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. It says in Romans, as he adds on to that. Are you following me? So, first thing we need to say is, Wow, God says we have battles in this life. So when we go through them, should we act surprised? In fact, we should go, wow, <laughs> took till 3 o'clock today, amazing. 
We ought to already know. I have to be prepared for that. Recognize when you are saying, hey, here is the, the not just even a warning, but just a, a reality. This is a part of life. And these things make it grow. I mean, if there wasn't trials and tribulations, country music wouldn't have anything to sing about. <laughs> Don't be knocking the country. I'm not really knocking it. Okay, maybe just a little. All right. But my wife has a song that she loves from Garth, and it's something about the rain, and because the rain, then he knows how to dance or something. And it's a nice song. You probably can fill it in the blanks for me. But the point is, is that those difficult times really, really do help us enjoy the good times. Amen? If any of you in here have ever dealt with chronic pain, Oh, it's a wonderful day when you don't have it. And some of you in here, you've had perfect health and you've had no idea on how you could just say thank you because you never really had it taken away from you. And he says, when you go through battles, and then it says this, against your enemies. And I'd like you to jot down just three that I put down. You could come up with your own. Uh, enemies. Enemies could be the secular system you have to work or go to school in. The secular system. I was just talking to... Um, Larson on the way in, and he was talking about how Amy, uh, who does our tattoo work and, and is doing this stuff upon him, she went to, I guess, L.A. or whatever, when I was on a show, one of those tattoo ink shows, and they were just giving her so much hassles for being a Christian. You know, we are no longer in an area where it's passive, or, oh, that's cool. If you've noticed, there seems to be a turning of the tide where it's actually aggressive towards you wanting to actually say, yeah, I think virginity is a cool thing. You know, yes, I actually believe in a God and a one God and a one way and a one Savior in the Lord. There is an aggressiveness no longer. In fact, I have found that the loudest proponents of tolerance are the least to give it to me. I'm not allowed to hold my view. My own senator, Akaka, writes me a letter when I share with him saying, hey, here's my view on HB 444. He writes back and says, we must fight for the equality of all faiths, creeds, uh, beliefs, uh, sexual orientation, so on and so forth, and not be discrimination. I'm sorry, sir. I thought you just said that you, we should allow for my belief because my belief should be included in there. And why is my belief called discrimination rather than an opinion? Are you following me? You see, folks, we're going to recognize that we are going to have enemies. In fact, I will tell you this right now, this bold. If you do not have enemies, you are probably not walking the Christian walk faithfully. Because light and dark do not coexist. And so if you're just blending with everybody, then you're not letting your light so shine. Because when the light is shining, it's a wonderful enhancement, but sometimes it really blinds when someone's looking in the wrong direction with it. So the first thing would be our secular system. The next thing that I put down is against your enemies, and I actually went ahead and put down in church. It's amazing how many times within churches there's different views uh, on this denomination, on that, so on and so forth. We're going to talk about that in the end as well as individuals within the church. And then the third thing that I put down there as far as our enemies, self. As I said, I think sometimes our self. Because here's what I think. This is what I put down here. I have observed that our society, we have a huge propensity to size up things all the time. You ever notice that? We're sizing up. I mean, it, literally, when somebody comes in like, ooh, that's a big guy. Or, hey, ooh, that's a big task. Or that is a big thing. You see... We fall prey to what the other ten spies did is that when we observe things, we tend to size up what we're looking at rather than looking at the size of our, our God. And so the very first thing he's saying is, number one, battles are a part of life. If you're living and breathing, you have battles. If you have no battles, there's probably six feet of dirt on top of you. Okay? Battles are a part of life. Look at me for a second ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. Now, raise your hand, all of you guys, you tripler and all you medical people. Raise your hand. Come on here, I can see all my meds out here. Okay. Isn't this, in fact, the good sign rather than this one? <laughs> Last time I checked, this is the winner. Winner, winner, winner. Oh, Lord. You're alive. The question is, are you growing? Because an experience isn't what happens to you. It's what you choose to do with that experience. It's either going to make you bitter or better. And Christian, today, tonight, I want you to hear this sermon and say, Lord, I hear. I'm getting it. I want to become better. 
when I face battles and I face enemies of multiple kinds. You see, it's very important because he goes on to say this. Notice, yes, I have not even finished verse 1. I have not finished the first sentence of verse 1. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you. Would you jot that down or take note of that? More numerous than you. When you see horses and chariots. Somebody translate that for me in their times to our times. Yeah, planes, tanks, you know, battalions. When you see horses and chariots, when you're a standing foot soldier and a guy with a little sword or a little stick of a spear and a guy is riding on you in a huge chariot coming at you, that's scary. Very scary. And Charlton Heston said one of the scariest things he ever did in his entire acting career was Ben-Hur. He said being in those chariots and around those chariots and those horses and the force that was in them, the thunder on the ground, he said it was frightening. He says he didn't have to act too hard in those scenes. It was really scary. And he says, when you see these horses and chariots, and then I love this line, and I really think this speaks to us tonight, more numerous than you. Would you just write over that in the fine print, peer pressure. When you find yourself sitting in the circle, standing at the water cooler, and the enemies, the secular system, the view, the opinion, peer pressure, more numerous than you, he's about to tell us what to do. Amen? Oh, this is so irrelevant, I swear. <laughs> when we find ourselves in the peer pressure of an army, of, 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 a, of an, a view, an opinion, something more numerous than us, what does he say? Highlight it in yellow. What does he say? <laughs> do not be afraid. Now, do not be afraid. Now, praise God that he's not just going to leave us there and just tell us what to do. As I said on Sunday, the thing I love about the Bible is it not just tells me what, but how, when, and where. But the first thing he tells me is what not to do, and that's wax. Don't be afraid, bro. When you get involved in these circumstances, when you're asked to go speak at something and you know that it's going to be a hostile environment, listen, bro, don't be afraid. Why? Because you need to be in, in a disconnect from your emotions. You, know, you need just to sit down. No, 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 not at all. Why should I not be afraid? Well, the Bible tells me not to fear, and the first reason why it tells me not to fear is 1 John 4.4. 4. What is that scripture? He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Jot that down on the margins there. 1 John 4.4. 4. He who is in us as Christians is greater than he who is in the world. Meaning, Satan is not the co-adversary with God. Satan is a created being. He was Lucifer, an angel. He was made by God and he chose to rebel. And he will get his due. And the Bible says that very clear. And so often we think that they're struggling, they're pulling a rope one side for us and the other side. And that is so not true. God is large and He's large and in charge. That's what makes God, God. It's not His name, it's His job description. So He says, listen, don't be afraid because God, the Creator of the universe, who chose to dwell within us because we have allowed Him to tabernacle in us because we asked for forgiveness, we asked that He would come in and cleanse our lives. He will not force Himself on anyone, but tonight if you ask Him, He will come and He will dwell. And the Spirit of God who dwells in you is greater than any spirit, any funk out there. As I've told you before, when I've been in demon possession situations and the demon possessed, whether it be a witch doctor or whether it be a person who we were working on an exorcism with, yes, those things happen. And when he started threatening me and saying, I'm going to, I'm saying, you ain't going to do nothing. You and I both know what the book says. You see, they love to operate on fear. Fear. What is fear? Jot it down somewhere we got rooms. F E A R. Fear stands for false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. You're looking at the chariots, wax. You're looking at the numbers more numerous than you. That's false evidence. You see, they came back, the ten spies, and said, those guys are huge. We're like grasshoppers. Yeah. But God, on the other hand, can you imagine that? Just the irony of that whole thing? Okay. This can't even be anywhere in the scenario. But just think of it as far as somebody yelling and screaming up at God and having them like this big on the floor to me. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I mean, seriously, an ant running across the table. Are you going to get up and freak? 
You know, and yet we're like, oh, look how many ants. Look how big my slipper. <laughs> One time, ga bang, aloha the ants. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we need tonight to get some things in context. Battles, yep. Do I look at the size of the problem? Nope. Why? Because I look at my God. Why? Because first He's promised to me that do not be afraid because He is greater. But then it says this, Do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God who brought you up from Egypt is where? Would you circle that? Underline that, highlight that, smiley face it, whatever you need to do. He is not some place when we get to chapter 30, it's going to say we don't have to climb up to heaven to find Him. We don't have to go over here. We don't have to do 20 things in order to get His attention. Again, as I said, how sad is it that I know of a particular religion, and most of you do as well, that when you come to worship, you have to first take this big stick, and you have to ring the bell and go gong, and then you have to clap three times, and then you have to go like this, and that's all to get the attention of the God. I'm so glad that God hears me when I go, ah! You know what that was? Ah! It means my skateboard just stopped and I didn't. And I'm now flying in the air. And as I look at the head of myself going towards the cement, I was, dear father, I know my wife told me not to skateboard anymore. And I know I should have been wearing a helmet, but nonetheless, protection would be wonderful. He gets it. That is God. A very personal and very loving God. And so when I see these things, I get to know that God is with me. You see, the point is, if you've got room somewhere in your notes, is Israel was never to be afraid Ever. Why? Because the outcome of any battle was never determined by military strength. Guys, you aren't to be afraid because the outcome of any battle is never going to be determined by military strength. Look at Gideon. Look at, look at just Jonathan and his armor bearer. Wiped out an entire battalion. Hey, let's see if God wants to rock tonight. Shoots. And they go up there. And God does amazing things. I mean, when's the last time we said, you know, God, even you... You, oh God, you can kill even my pride. And I know that's a monster that no one has been able to kill yet, but God, you can, because you're the slayer of monsters. You can kill that pride. You can kill that lust. God, you can kill these things in my life and these battles that I'm, fight and I'm fighting and I'm waging war with. Don't be sitting here tonight and telling me, it's just, I can't. No, you can't, but God can. The question is, have you let go so that God can take it and deal with it? That's the question where we're at tonight. You see, turn to Isaiah with me if you would. Go to Isaiah chapter 31. Join me at verse 1. Isaiah 31, 1. It seems that God, through His prophets, had to constantly remind His people, like we need to constantly be reminded. Amen? And so here He is. Reminding them that, guys, it's not about the count, what you see, the chariots, and so on and so forth. Just like Gehazi needed to have his eyes open with the chariots of fire that was around him. He was looking at the wrong things. It says in chapter 31 of Isaiah, verse 1, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. What does the first word in this chapter say to us? Woe. Woe. <laughs> God is saying, woe. When God says woe, I think we should pay attention. That, that's, a, that's a huh? Woe. When you go to Egypt, when you try to mount yourself up with legal things and legal this and so on and so forth and start counting what you can do and what your repercussions are and your things that God says, whoa, because you want to wage in the flesh, then you're going to suffer the consequences of the flesh. But if you want to walk in the spirit, then you will be blessed by and through the spirit. He's saying, whoa, if you start going down to Egypt, if you start thinking, I need to stack this, I just need to start doing this and that instead of going where, where should we go? It says right there in the last part, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. You see, folks, when you get yourself in a circumstance, you find yourself in a circumstance, it's not get on your phone, it's get on your knees. It's stop, drop, and pray. That's where we need to be. That's why we will find the strength of the Lord. He says this, verse 2, when he's talking about woe to those who go that way rather than the Lord's way, yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and does not retract his words. 
but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of the workers of iniquity. Now, the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. So the Lord will stretch out His hand, and he who helps will stumble, and he who was helped will fall, and all of them will come to an end together. God is saying all God needs to do is just go, and they're done. Picks up his slipper, wa-bang. Meaning, whatever it is that is your battle tonight, God is large and God is able. He is able, he is able, he is able. And the scriptures go over and over. Some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the Lord. I can show you so many scriptures that talk about that. And so the point is, is that we aren't to be afraid. Why? Because God is where? With us. With us. How do I know that God is with me? As I said to you before, when someone says to me, how do you know God is real? Well, I've been talking to him all day. He's been talking to me. It's the same thing. When we keep ourselves in prayer, then we recognize God is with us. And thus, when the situation comes, I like how uh, Greg Laurie puts it. He says, if you're in fellowship with Jesus, when Satan comes knocking at the door, you can say, Jesus, would you get that? I like that. That works for me. Lord, I'm having a little right. Would you get that, please? Would you get the door? This is a toughie for me. Now, the thing that we want to be able to notice is basically the summary of verse 1 is a question. Where are our eyes? Where are our eyes? Are our eyes on the Lord? Set your mind on the things above, Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Are, are, are our eyes focused on the Lord? Are they focused on the sides of our problem tonight? If you leave this place focusing on your problem, you're going to be just as defeated as you came in here. But if tonight, if through the Holy Spirit, through His Word, He began to show you a great and awesome and mighty God, you might begin to find deliverance and find victory because Jesus wins His battles. Now, verse 2 says this, Now it shall come about that when you are approaching the battle, please note, the priest shall come near and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies today. Do not be faint-hearted. Do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them. Notice, when you're going into battle, who are they to have the, to go with them? The priest. The priest. Now today, we still have our, our chaplains in the military, which is awesome. But, you know, that does today also a very eclectic expression of every view and faith that's out there. But nonetheless, I know that my buddy Gary on Molokai, who was serving as a pastor after 9-11, he was moved and said, hey, I'm taking what God has given me. And he signed up in the army and he spent two tours already in Iraq. Because he is there to be there to be with them. Because you see, the priests were to be a representation to the people that God is with them. Now, we have heard a gazillion times in this Old Testament passage as we've gone through who are the priests? Second Peter, you are the priesthood of the believers. So that means God has strategically placed you where you work, where you go to school, so that there may be priests among the people to remind them that God is with them. Did we do our duty today? You see, on Sunday, I challenged us to pray that God would give us just one person in this month, one person that we could share the gospel with, to the point that they would become a Christian, they would become saved, and we would disciple them into maturity. And if we just did that, we saw the amazing fruit that would happen from that. Did we do our duty today? Did we look around and say, Lord, is it this person? Is it this person? Did we just throw out hooks to see if we could find an engaging conversation? Drew is at my house working right now, trying to get some things done, trying to actually get some progress gone to my house. And, and a couple of, uh, yesterday, a couple of Mormons came by. And they began to engage. They were sorry that they did. Because Drew, fresh off a of Sunday sermon, was like, well, great, I'll tell you. Now, who's Jesus? And da, da, da. And pretty soon, they, you know, they had, there's the two guys, and the one guy started talking with them, and he could recognize he was going, uh, uh, the other guy comes, and then Drew starts talking, and they're like, hey, you know what? You look like you're busy. We got to go by. But you know what? We just, after he came in and he shared that with me, I just prayed. I said, Lord, I just pray that just, just a little bit was rattled to the point that they would say, do we really know what we know? Because again, are we willing to do for the truth what cults are doing for an untruth, for a lie? You see, we need to ask ourselves, where are we living out our lives? 
And so it says here, the priest shall come near and speak to the people. And what are the priests supposed to say? What are we, the people, supposed to be? Hey, guys, don't be afraid. Don't panic. Don't be faint-hearted. Don't tremble. You see, the priests were to let them know two things. One, that God's presence was there and He was to encourage them about God's ability. When you've got a friend at the water cooler and talking about their marriage coming to a fault, and it's gonna do, you just say, can I pray with you? Hey, you just found out that you have cancer. Can I pray with you? Hey, can I bring the authority, the presence, the power of God into your life and tell you about it? Let's just go back to the beginning of this book. Just go to chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 20. Chapter 1, verse 20. Or 30, excuse me. Chapter 1, verse 30. In the very beginning when he starts, it says, The Lord your God who goes before you will Himself fight on your behalf, just as He did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, how the Lord God carried you just as a man carries his son all the way which you have walked until you come to this place. Isn't that awesome? We need to be reminded that God says, hey, I will fight for you and I will even carry you. Why don't you just go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 22. Chapter 3, verse 22. Do not fear them. For the Lord your God is the one, what? Fighting for you. Do not be afraid. The battle. The Lord is fighting. And now, here's the situation that I'd like you to understand. Let me have your attention this way, please. There is a phrase in the Scripture that a lot of people do not understand because we put it in our colloquialism. The phrase is, the battle belongs to the Lord. And it is in several Scriptures. And tonight, as we're looking at battles, it says, I'm, try- I'm standing here in front of you tonight and saying, it's His fight. If you give it to Him, if you say, hey, Satan... Jesus is getting the door. He's taking that fight. He's taking care of the battle belongs to the Lord. But here's the thing. When we hear that phrase, we think that it's saying that it's God's fight. No, it's beyond that. What it is, it's the phrase that if Johnny and I were fighting and we started doing a boxing and we're like, boom, 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 pretty soon there would be one person knocked out and all of a sudden then they would come and they'd say, the battle belongs to... I was to say Johnny. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. They say that to this day. They say, and the battle belongs to... It's meaning the victor. Isn't that awesome? Not only is it God's fight, but He's the victor. So can we please just get out of the way? Can we please get out of the way? You see, it would be for us to say, no, I'm good, I'm going to stay in there. And when I got Holyfield right there going, tag me, tag me. I'm ready, I'll come in, I'll take care of that punk. He's gone, he's gone. Are we going to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to tag you you come in because you will bring forth victory. My job is to, re- to break apart the fear. F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. Why? Verse 4 tells me again. For the Lord your God is the one who goes what? Circle that. With you. And will fight. What's it say? For you. Against your enemies too. Okay. Now. You might tonight, whether it's your first time or been here since we started the Bible study going, okay, we got it. All right, cool. Move on. Really? Really? Because my counseling load doesn't seem to reflect that. And the pastors and the staff and the things and the trials and tribulations that are going on, really? Do we really understand what it means to say, God, you rock? And I'm not to be afraid because you are the one that fights for me. You're the one that saves me. And if God can save me, he can do anything. Amen? If God can save me, He can do anything. And you see, we need to put this message to to practice in our lives. For the Lord your God, verse 4, is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to save you. Now, next thing, it says this. First the priests go out, then the officials. We have two different things. we got the priests and then the officers. It says, then the officers also shall speak to the people saying, who is the man who has built a new house and is not dedicated to it? Let him depart and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. And who is the man that has planted a vineyard and has not begun to use its fruit? Let him depart and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man begin to use the fruit. And who is the man who is engaged to a woman and has not married her? Let him depart and return to his house, lest he die in battle, and another man marry her. Then the officers shall speak further to the people, and they shall say, Who is the man that is afraid and faint-hearted? Let him depart and return to his house, so that he might not make his brother's hearts melt like his heart. Verse 9, And it shall come about that when the officers have finished speaking to the people, they shall appoint commanders of the armies and the heads of the people. Very, very important. Four things we're going to jot down in these scriptures. Number one, we have battles, but 
When we go into battle, it is important that we go with qualified fighters. God says, hey, battles are a part of life. But when you're going into these battles, it is critical. It is important that you go in with qualified fighters. And for that reason, he gives us four or five, depending on how you look at it tonight, different criteria where these people are supposed to go home. You're supposed to go home if you fill in these categories. Why? Well, let me just jump ahead and tell you, and then we'll work it through. Because the real question is, where's your head and where's your heart? A half-hearted, half-minded, double-minded individual is worth nothing in a firefight. You see, it's easy to be in the cheerleader pep rallies. That's what my main difficulty is with extreme Pentecostalism in a lot of churches, where there's so much hoopla and shouting and screaming and so on and so forth, and they say, wow, the Spirit was moving so much that we didn't even take time for the Word, and we just continue to shout and praise. That reminds me of when I went to a particular high school that we used to have our pep rallies, and we're like, yay, kill Lincoln, we're going to destroy Lincoln, and yeah, dun, 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 and we're like, yay. And then we show up to the game, and we kick off to Lincoln, and the guy catches the, the initial kickoff and runs all the way back for a touchdown, and we're like, we stink. <laughs> One of those seasons again, oh, we're just a bunch of losers, you know what I mean? What happened to the pep rally? When you got no substance, you got a lot of fluff, but no stuff in the firefight, you're the runner. You're the runner. Amen? Am I making sense? And so God is saying, hey, listen, there are criteria here that you might be sitting here tonight and going, yeah, I agree. You'll go, go right on. Woo! But do you fall into these categories? You see, he starts saying we need to have qualified people. What you need to note is that the most qualified people were not always the most gifted. Write that down. Nothing here is talking about gifting. In God's economy, the most qualified are not the most gifted. They're the most committed. I will take a new believer who does not know much of the Scriptures at all, but says, hey, Lord, take my life. If you need to slay me, slay me, but let's just go do something. I will take that person far beyond someone who's a 20-year deacon who's a butt-sitter. Any time, any day, I'd rather go with someone who says, I'm committed to God because I know that God is committed to me. He died on a cross. He hung on a cross. Nails didn't hold him up there. His love did. And his commitment, this is love, when a man will lay down his life. How about us? I want to be in a church that has people that says, Lord, I want to lay down my life. Not get blessed. Not be all concerned about what others are thinking of me. But Lord, what do I think of them? And how am I serving you? That's the church I want to go to. And so that's why we teach what he says here. And prayerfully, we are those people. Not the most qualified, but the most committed. And God will take our inability when we give Him our availability and He will qualify the called. And He will work with us. So the first question tonight is, where is your heart? Now, where is your heart? Well, let's look at the summary here in verse 9. Verse 9, first things are these who are supposed to go back. These are what I summarize as those who are supposed to go back. Number one, is your household stable? Is your household stable? If your household isn't stable, go home. When it means coming into the battle... He says, first things first, you can't be out running around this if you have your own house. If you haven't even finished this, you haven't dedicated this, or things you have not yet done that God has told you to do in your home, then get on it. If he says, reconcile, reconcile. If he says, hey, you need to start working on submission to your husband, start to me. If you need to start loving your wife as Christ loved the church and humble yourself as he did on a cross, then get on it. Make sure what it needs to be dedicated, meaning your heart. He says, if your house hasn't been dedicated yet, go back. Well, let's dedicate our lives to being Christ-like in the home. Amen? That's what he says. Let's quit fooling ourselves. Let's quit being double standard, double minded, and letting the world mock us because we are the hypocrites. Let's start going, okay, Lord, my house isn't where if it isn't stable, I need to go on. Next thing he says, is the work of your hands thriving? Is the work of your hands, in other words, you start things, but you never even finished it. Oh my gosh, are we filled with that kind of mentality today? All kinds of folks who sign up for things and then never show up or never finish or they start something and they start Bible studies. It's amazing how many Bible studies start with 25 and end with 9. It's amazing to us. We just already count the attrition level. I'm sorry, but we do. Someone says, hey man, I had 30 people. I need to have a new place. I don't know. Give it four weeks after the attrition level, then we'll figure out. Because after four weeks, you're going to start seeing the folks, well, I just kind of got busy. I'm just, I want to go to the study, but I'm just too busy. T-O-O-B-U-S-Y. Totally over-occupied being under Satan's yoke. Hmm. Am I free to be? 
shaped and molded and dedicated to the Lord? Or am I bound by the kingdom of kingdom? See, is the work of your hands thriving? How about this one? Is your marriage healthy? Is your marriage healthy? Because you need to be focusing on that. If you have engaged to this gal and you've not even had a chance to marry, you need to take care of your promises. You promised something. Let's go back and do it. And in fact, in chapter 24, we won't look there. You can just jot it down. In chapter 24, verse 5, it says even he adds on one more to this. And he says to you who have been married in the first year, in your first year of marriage, don't go off the battle. And it's amazing how many of you in this room whom I have married and how many of you have found yourselves in, again, such busyness rather than being about his business, and that is taking care of your wife. Loving on her, pouring into her, making her feel the cherished gift that she is from God. That's what God says. He says, listen, don't be running off into battle and start opening a new business and starting a new thing in here and getting involved in 20 different ministries and just, no, 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 no. You just got married. First things first, let's be dedicated to what God has given to you. Why? Because faithful with little is. And some of you are wondering why things are floundering. The Lord is saying, hey, let's start before we go on off into other battles. Let's start by keeping our word on the things he's already called us to do. Amen, church? One more. If you notice, he talks about the household, the work, and then the marriage. And then the last one, verses 8 and 9, is, is your heart full of faith? Is your heart full of faith? He says, listen, if you're afraid, go, because that's cancer. That just spreads. If your heart is full of faith, full of fear, excuse me, you are not going to be being a blessing. Now, when I'm talking about go, I'm not saying get out of this church, you got no business here. Not at all. That is not what this pastor is saying. What I'm saying is that we need to go and get right on the priorities first. Are you hearing me? And so tonight, if you are one who is afraid, then during our afterglow time, come on up to one of the pastors of some of the counselors that are on the side and say, hey, I want God to help me with my fear problems, the false evidence appearing real, and da, da 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 And I want to be a person who believes that God can and do these things, and I don't know why I'm terrified at night. I don't know why I'm terrified of this or that. I want God to heal me by revealing to me that His presence is there and He is all I need. That is what I'm talking about. You see, if a man here tonight does not have his family where it needs to be, he needs to tend to that first. If he doesn't have a job and he wants others to be supporting him, he should get a job and succeed in that first. If a man has a lousy marriage, he shouldn't be taken on further ministry. And if a man is full of fear, he shouldn't try to hide behind ministry or missions. That's what he's saying. Before we start taking on new battles and going to new places, let's make sure first things first, we've done what we're supposed to do. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Thank you for letting me be so bold and so straightforward. Because this is what God wants us to be. Now, verse 10, he says this. Now, when you are, if you are a qualified fighter because you are committed and you now join the team, we step into the battle before the firefight. Verse 10 says this. When you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. Just as he did with Nineveh. Hey, Jonah was told to go through and say, hey guys, in 30 days, destruction comes. Repent. God is not a God who is this malicious reactor. And people say, well, why would God go out and destroy? Because it was consequences of them rebelling against God. God did not do any uh, ethnic cleansing whatsoever. It was an ideology, meaning rebellion. They chose their gods and did not want to listen to the one true God. You were to come and approach a city and give it peace. In fact, jot down Ezekiel 33.11 and turn there with me if you would. Ezekiel 33.11. Ezekiel 33.11. A favorite scripture of mine, one that I use often in my evangelizing with folks. It says this. He says, I take no delight. I would encourage you to know. I take no delight in the death of the wicked. Rather, that they would turn from their evil ways and live. Notice he says again, turn back, turn back and live. Why then, oh, why will you die? Do you hear the heart of God there? Then I don't want to spank. I want to bless. But I am also a holy and just and righteous God, and so I cannot turn my eye, a blind eye, to compromise. There is no white lie to God. It's a lie or it's truth. And so he is saying, hey, listen, right is right and wrong is wrong. And so I take no delight in the death of the wicked. Rather, that they would turn. Turn from your evil ways and live. Why then, oh, why will you die? Is the heart of God. Not some cosmic cop with a holy radar gun just seeking to bust. 
And I think so often that's what we kind of portray him to be. Verse 11 says this, And it shall come about that if it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then it shall be that the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. Again, that sounds to us like cruel. Before other places, they would be utterly destroyed. He's saying you are to bring them in if they choose to humble themselves before the word and the way of God. Then he says, however, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives them into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. Only the women and the children and the animals that are all that is in the city and all of the spoil shall you take as booty for yourselves and you shall use the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given to you. So he's saying you are about to go into this area that I'm giving you on these surrounding cities on the outside here. Go through it and make peace and say, hey, the Lord has come before you. The prophet has come before you. Do you want to accept that? No, we want to fight. OK, you want to fight? Great. God will give you victory when he does. Then those who are the men, they are to kill because they are the strength. They are the tanks. Those are the weapons. And so those are to be removed. And then the families are to be treated with generosity, so on and so forth, and brought in to be servants within the community. That's the first thing that he says for them to do on these outlying areas. And I'm going to make a bigger point on that in a moment. So first thing to understand that God says, hey, when there's this battle, first things first is he's going to say, I want to share with you the truth. Then however you respond to the truth is however God is going to respond to you. Then we have verse 15, which is what we need to pay attention to because it sounds like it's contradictory and it's not. You need to know your maps and then you'll understand. But it says, thus you shall do to the cities that are very far from you. What we just said, those are the ones that are the outlining cities. Those that are far, those are the ones you make terms of peace, which are not of the cities of the nations nearby. Verse 16, only in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving to you as an inheritance you shall not leave alive anything that breathes. Now, if you need to know more information on that, we took a lot of time on Deuteronomy 18. You can go online, onelove.org, click on the message and hear it. But as we talked about before, the problem in allowing folks to quote unquote live, as we look at it in the context, we see that them coming in would not be an individual, but they brought in their culture, their mindset, their ideology, their beliefs, and it soon began to be like cancer and would destroy the hearts of the people of God. You see, light and darkness, as we saw on Sunday, cannot coexist. Amen? And so he's saying, listen, on these outside areas, then awesome. But where you live, hear me now, in your own home, there is to be no tolerance for that which is of the devil. There is to be no making peace and saying, well, I know it's not that bad of a movie. Well, if it's that, if there's bad, it's bad, it's bogus. Would you sit down and say, Jesus, I love this one. Watch this with me. If the answer is no, then guess what? You made him do that because if he dwells in you, you made him watch that movie. And I'm sure the whole time he's going, why are you making me watch this? What's up? Don't you have any John Wayne's? I got a couple thumbs up out there. Amen. Hallelujah. Little fella. All right. No compromise. And again, that's a whole nother sermon. But the point is, is that we need to as far as, hey, how are things in my home? How are things in my business? How are things in my heart? And the same thing now here again in our own areas where God is calling you to be. This is where I need you to keep clean. And that's why he says it right here. Uh, he says in verse 17, he says, but you shall utterly destroy them. These now we don't know these names unless you understand. He's telling them about the area of Canaan. Every name he's about to list is right there where God says, this is your home. Now, how do I know that? Look at me for a second. How do I know that? Because again, reading the Bible. In Genesis chapter 15 is where we know God has given the land to Abraham. Abraham and his descendants are living there. Then we have a famine and they leave. And as they leave, then these other folks have come in because God is blessing them because Joseph and they're having everybody in Gershon and they're having a great time down there near Egypt as God is blessing him. So they, these individuals come in. They are told, hey, this is not for you. This is what God has. It's tough. We're here. That our gods will take care of us. They've been given things and they've been told, hey, this is not for you. You need to leave. You need to go. And they're saying, no, this is us. We'll fight for it. This is now the consequences of their rebellion. So now he says this, but you shall, verse 17, utterly destroy them. The Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Pezzarite and the Hivite and the Oberbite and the Jebusite. <laughs> and the Lord your God has commanded you. Take care of all of them. Why? Verse 18 again. In order that. Box that out. Put a box around that. In order that. 
they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things which they have done to their gods so that you would sin against the Lord your God. Church, I'm just going to say it again. We grow to resemble our environments. Amen? We grow to resemble our environments. You cannot think that you can stick around an environment and not have it have an impact on you. Haven't you found it interesting that even here now three times in the last six months or so in Hawaii, someone has been now stabbed trying to break up a fight? We got the one man who was beaten to the point that he died, the elderly gentleman, just walking the streets of Waikiki. And so there's a fight going on. He tries to separate, and then they jump him and beat him, and then he dies. And just this week, another guy, fight's going on. He's trying to stop, and they turn, and they stab him. Folks, again, these types of things, trying to do a good thing, but when you're in the wrong places with the wrong people, the wrong attitude, those kinds of things happen. No one is going to stab you here tonight in the house of the Lord. You see, we need to recognize what are our environments? What are we placing ourselves around? Amen? Very, very important. He's saying so that they do not have the influence upon you. Any surfer in this room knows this illustration I'm talking about. And that is that you take a milk carton, you fill it full of water so that you can have a shower after you surf, you leave it in the back of your truck, it gets all warm, you think that's great, you're taking a little warm shower, and then you forget and you open your mouth. And what do you taste? Plastic milk. That water tastes like plastic milk. It took on the flavor of the plastic container and the milk that was inside there. It's horrible. And the only thing of worse than that is when folks from the southern origin come out here and start talking pigeon. <laughs> Y'all gonna do the kind? I mean, we're just like, oh. but you know. The reverse is true too, you know. Get the local folk who are trying to talk, you know, perfect English in court. Oh, that's right, you're on a ship. <laughs> <laughs> I was hiding, uh, um, parked on the side when I noticed his excessive rate of fastness. And, um. <laughs> you're going to be who you're around, amen? You're going to talk like that, you're going to talk like that. So now, he says, guys, in this world we're going to have battles. Know that. Recognize that. Turn to me. I'm there. I'm ready. I'm pumped. I know what's going on, God is saying. And you know what? I'm going to bring people around you. What kind of people? Well, the kind of people that are here tonight. The kind of people that are saying, hey, on a Wednesday night, God, I want you to come and speak to my heart. I'm going to let you use that little port of and let him just speak to my heart. And begin to say, hey, there's things in my life that need to be corrected and need to be prepared. And things I need to take business with. Things that I need to say is okay. Things I need to kill. That I need to cut off this relationship. I need to cut off this compromise in my life. Because it's killing me. It's killing my joy. It's killing my passion. It's killing my fruit. And I tell you, one of the best ways to know that that's happened is because you were so concerned about yourself. When is the last time you, you, wept over injustice? Someone going to hell? The situations going on around us in our state? See, when has our prayers been something other than, Lord, help this, this, this in my life. Oh, and this, this, and this as well. Or have we cried out and said, God, so many, so confused, so destined to hell. What can I do? Take my life, Lord, and let it be. But you see, when God says it's time for us to go in, notice what He even says, because God is a God of control. God is a God of order. God says this in verse 19 and 20. He says, when you besiege a city a long time, then make war against it in order to capture it. Please note, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an axe against them. He goes on, For you may eat from them. You shall not cut them down. For this for is the tree of the field a man, and it should, that it should be besieged by you. See, God is the author and the finisher. God is the provider. He is the creator of the universe. He made everything, and He said at the beginning to Adam, Go and be fruitful and multiply and take care of the earth. 
You see, what would happen in those days when you would come and you would conquer, a sign of your conquering would be not only to kill every man, woman, child, lamb, animal, everything else, but cut down every single tree. Make it a wasteland. God says, that's not what I want you to do. When you come in, notice the fruit trees. And he's going to say in the next verse, hey, there are trees that aren't bearing fruit. Hey, you need those in order to besiege the city. You need it for wood. You need it for fortifications, those kinds of things. Great. But don't just go wildly swinging an axe. Notice he goes on to say, verse 20, only the trees which you know that are not fruit trees you shall destroy and cut down that you may construct siege works against that city that is making war with you until it falls. Please note, only the trees which you are, which you know, would you please underline, which you know are not fruit trees. Verse 19, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an axe. I have highlighted. And then it says, only the ones which you know are not fruit bearing trees. What's my point, guys? This, we need to be careful that we're not just swinging an axe all the time at folks who might have different beliefs than us. We shouldn't just go wildly swinging an axe, especially to other different denominations, which I hear churches doing all the time and just going, oh, those Lutherans or oh, those Catholics or oh, those Baptists or oh, those Calvary Chapel people or whatever it is. And you just start swinging an axe because you know what? There's something that you disagree with them in some point of theology. God says, careful, you might be cutting down something that's bearing fruit. Folks, are there Catholic churches that are emphasizing works versus than the gospel? Yes. Are there Catholic churches that are teaching the word of God and evangelically preaching and people getting saved? Yes. Are there Baptist churches that are so lost in legalism that there's no fruit of the Holy Spirit in it? Yes. Are there Baptist churches that God is alive and working and people are getting saved every day? Yes. God is at work. Let's not just go swinging and saying, oh, those such and such is because I'll tell you right now, one of my dear friends is a, a pastor on Molokai, Episcopalian female, and she is leading people to Jesus Christ. And she has this view very biblical on everything that the Bible says as far as in homosexuality, heterosexuality, and everything else, so much so that she's always in trouble with her denomination, but she feels called to be there to be a light. So let's be a little careful on swinging our axes and just saying, hey, these people, da, 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 da. no, no, no. Say, this is what God says, and this is where I want to line myself up, and I'll let God be the judge of those other things. Amen? Hallelujah, church. We have a battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. He is the victor. But in this battle, we are not to fear, because fear is the opposite of faith. We need to set our eyes on the Lord and recognize that He is large and in charge. When I see the Lord, He will then share with me, okay, Waxer, you want to do something about this? You want to be involved? Great. How's your house? Is your house in order, brother? Is your marriage in order? And if you're a single person, meaning your purity, are you set up in a place where you are being a person that God says, yes, this is a pure and upright vessel. They are walking and dedicated. Is the labor of your hands fruitful? Are you have a job? Are you working? Are you providing? You see, you need to go and make sure you're taking care of that. Your vineyard is being taken care of. It's being fruitful and it's multiplying so that you're not dependent upon others, but you can go forth and be fruitful and be a blessing. He says, you get these things right, you get your heart right. God says, let's go do some business for the kingdom. Amen? Hey, Pulikha, go. Heavenly Father, we want to be significant, Lord. We want to be effective. We want to be effective, Lord Jesus. We want to be used. Lord, we want you to say, yes, these brethren right here, these are ones that I can send into a firefight. For at the water cooler, when there was numbers more numerous than them, when they saw chariots and horses, instead they looked to me and said, Lord, give me the boldness to say, hey, that's probably not what we should say about the boss. Or that's probably not the best joke to share in a common place like this. Or whatever it would be. Lord, we know that we are not the sin police, Lord Jesus. We are not to be Pharisees, but we are to be a light. We are to be salt. We are to bring flavor and preservative in a planet that you have called us to minister to. And so, God, I ask for forgiveness when we've just gone so quickly to warrior mode and we just start swinging axes at people because we disagree. There might be elements in their life that they are bearing fruit that we know not. For you say, judge not lest you be judged for the way in which you judge, so shall you be judged. And so, Lord, tonight I pray for your graciousness upon us. I pray for your mercy and your grace. Forgive us, Lord, when we have gone down to Egypt rather than stopping and dropping and praying and asking for you to provide for us. When we've called 20 friends before we've ever even prayed and said, Lord, here, these are my needs. I'm concerned. Father, I'm fighting with depression. Father, I'm fighting with this lust problem. Father, I'm fighting with this situation. Lord, my marriage seems to be hopeless, but you are the God of hope, and I'm going to consider it pure joy 
when I face these trials, knowing that the testing of my faith produces perseverance. Because the perseverance is in the promise of God. 